instead. Um, Kudal's JavaScript. Okay, excellent. Uh, what what do, when we think of JavaScript as web developers, what do we think it's for? Everything. Everything. Okay. <laughs> Bean stack. Bean stack's great. Anybody else? Come on. What do you do with JavaScript? What do you do with jQuery? Interactivity, web pages, right? Manipulating the DOM, making AJAX requests, all that fun stuff. Well, that's right. <laughs> uh, so I hate JavaScript in the browser, but I love <coughs> JavaScript on the operating system level. Um, if, you're, if you're not incredibly familiar with JavaScript, like I said, it does things like manipulate your web page. It makes it so your web page can become more interactive. Facebook is just dripping with JavaScript. Uh, because and you notice you go to facebook.com and it loads in things. You get chat messages pop up and your notification bubble pops at the top. It's all JavaScript making your web page more interactive. Um, now JavaScript in its of itself is just a programming language. It's a syntax, right? And in, in WebKit, in Google Chrome, in Safari and Internet Explorer, JavaScript is exposed to a series of APIs that let you do these things like making web requests on behalf of the browser and manipulating the DOM and interacting with it. But when you think about what a programming language is, it's, it's really, I think of it more as like a syntax and a way to accomplish something where something is the fill in the blank, uh, something is provided by those APIs. So with Node.js, which is something that's gonna allow you to run JavaScript on your server or at, on a host level, not so much in the browser, but on a step above that is on the server, you're gonna have the ability to interact with different APIs. Um, so with Node.js, you can interact with the file system. You can open ports and listen on ports. You can um, do, just do so much more. You can interact with the operating system on a much more intimate level. This is a light switch. I have two of these in my house. Um, so what's really neat about these, and uh, Tom, did he leave? Oh, this is where I'm yeah. okay. uh, <laughs> the, These light switches are cool because there's no power, no batteries, no wires, but it still works. Um, so you press these little buttons, and you hear how loud it is, right? That's because the mechanics of you pressing the button generate the electricity to give off the wireless signal. It's considered energy harvesting. And this little guy right here is a receiver. So push this button, this is plugged into my computer, it receives a signal, and it's gonna send a packet through the serial port into the computer. Well, a year ago you said, Adam, how do you connect to the serial port? I'd be like, LOL call somebody else, because uh, I know how to use jQuery and Angular, and that's about it. But with Node.js, I actually am able to uh, connect to this, and thanks to Tom Rankin, um, I was able to figure out how to decode the packets that this sends through the serial port, and <coughs> interpret which button was pressed, and then do something with it. For instance, oh, I don't know, make an API call to Philips Hue and turn my lights on and off. So I'm a nerd who made my own physical switch at home for my connected light bulbs. Um, so that's just kind of an idea of what Node.js is gonna let you do by interacting with the operating system on such a more intimate level than you can in just in a browser sandbox environment. Um, who's heard of Atom, A-T-O-M, editor? Yes, it's great, isn't it? It's a, it's a new up and coming competitor to Sublime Text. It's released by GitHub. And in case you didn't know, it's written 100% in JavaScript. Cool, right? Um, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. It runs in a Node.js environment so that the, uh, the this application can use Node.js to interact with your file system. Obviously, I've got it really small here, but if I wanted to, um, it's got a list of my files here. I can click on a file, view the contents. I can edit it. I can install different color schemes, which are, guess what, CSS files. Um, and, and so that, that's what's really cool about Adam Editor. Um, it's really extensible. Also, you'll notice that I've got updates down here, so if I were to click on this, I can see that, okay, it's gonna check for the plugins that I have that can be updated. I'll go ahead and update them, and it's just gonna work. It's beautiful. Um, Sublime Text has package control, that sounds cool. So, what, who's heard of Cordova? PhoneGap? AppGyver? Okay, seriously, who's heard of AppGyver? Yeah, if you haven't, if you have heard of Cordova, look up AppGyver, it's amazing. Um, so Cordova is a, an operating system level wrapper for mobile devices that allows you to ship HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And all it does is display a mini web page on your phone without a back button, right? 
right? It's just a, it's a, it, it makes it appear as a native app. So if you design your web page to look like a mobile app, it'll run like a mobile app. And of course, that JavaScript also is going to give you access to some APIs to talk to the operating system to uh, do various things, receive push notifications, request the device ID for push notifications, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's what Cordova is. Well, Electron is the same thing, but for the desktop. So what we're able to do with Electron is, again, just build HTML, CSS, and JavaScript applications, which we're all good at, right? Yeah. And ship a desktop application, which to me is really cool. Um, now, a couple of things that Electron will do. Uh, well, well, I was talking to Mike about this, and he helped me a lot with this talk, coming up with ideas. And as I was talking with him, I was trying to come up with arguments, like why on God's green earth would us web developers, who ever so much love our production web servers, am I right, and the flexibility, uh, when you can't control that kind of stuff on a desktop environment, so why would you bother shipping an application built by a web developer onto the desktop? I think it's awesome because you have the ability to interact more intimately with the operating system. For instance, my light switches. Instead of building it in just Node.js and making the API calls out to my light bulbs, I could have built a desktop application that serves as a remote for my light bulbs and also allows me to configure how my switches operate. Um, again, just using the skill set that I already have as a web developer. Uh, so I think that's really exciting. Um, the other thing that a lot of people might say is, well, I can hit a button in my favorite Laravel 4 deployment tool and ship my code to my web server. And all of a sudden, my application's updated. Anybody who's working with my application immediately has the latest version because they just access it through the internet, which is cool, absolutely, and I love it just as much as the next guy. But with Electron, you have the ability to do that kind of as well. Uh, built into Electron, which again is the wrapper around your application source code, has the ability to talk to an update server. So you can run a little server that is considered your update server, and um, it will just say, hey, here's what version I have, and your update server will say, hey, here's the new version. And then your, your code can say, all right, well, I've got an update, so let's prompt the user to update and restart my application. Well, and since the wrapper, which is the binary, which is what you submit to Apple, uh, to iTunes Connect if you're distributing it on Mac, that binary is constant. It stays the same because it's just Electron, but it's your source code that's just pretty much a file sitting inside the package that can be updated. So when you hit update and restart, it downloads it from your update server, puts it into place and restarts your app, and all of a sudden your entire application's updated, which I think is really cool. Uh, who uses Slack? Yeah. Slack's built on Electron. Cool, right? Um, Adam's built on Electron. Uh, what are some other ones? Uh, Kitematic, anybody use Kitematic? Docker people? Yes, thank you, it's built on Electron. Um, Visual Studio Code? I'm sorry? Visual Studio Code? Digital Studio Code, is Visual it? Studio Code. Visual, I don't know, is it? Yeah, I think so. Any of these logos that I don't know what they all are, but these are all apps that are built on Electron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a logo for it up there. Yeah. Uh, oh, here, yeah. Um, what's it called? Uh, Kraken, Git Kraken. Mm. This is the one I was telling you about, Mike. This is a, um, an, an, uh, Electron application, but it is a Git client. So you're looking at my Git history for my uh, BCX DSC re Git repository. Kind of neat that it's just an Electron app. It just came out a while ago. So you can tell I'm not very prepared for this talk because you guys are a bunch of buddies coming in from out of town to see me. So we're kind of going along this as, as we go together. Um, as I was talking to Mike, I was like, what, you know, what should we, what should we write? What should we build? Because I want to uh, light a spark in you guys and somehow show you, trigger the light bulb that says, oh, that's something I can do. Here's how I can benefit my application by shipping it this way. Or here's something I can ship as an application that would help me, help other developers, help people solve problems, whatever it may be, uh, using the current skill set you have. So that's my goal. So I was asking Mike, what is something that we can show that's quick, simple, and does just that. Illustrates that, yeah, it's built on JavaScript, but integrates with the operating system on a much more intimate level. And we came up with a couple ideas. I'm sorry, I'm trying to say out. Sorry, guys. Um, so I have um, one, two, three, four, five. This one doesn't belong. I got four apps that I'm gonna <laughs> show you guys that I built in the past couple weeks. Uh, this first one's called Runner. 
uh, and I'm just going to run it here. Now, obviously, when you when you when you ship your application, it will be shipped as a binary. You don't have to boot it up from the command line. But just during the development and for the sake of this demo, that's what I've done. Um, anybody know what uh, styling framework this is? Twitter Bootstrap, correct. It's really straightforward stuff. This particular application uses Facebook Parse as a backend, as a service. Uh, really plainly <coughs> put, Facebook Parse is a schemaless database you can use, kind of like Firebase, and it also does user authentication and also makes it really easy to integrate with Facebook, obviously. Um, so I've got maybe a login. Oh, come on. Passwords need to go away. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, so this application is really simple. This JSON object here is just, I have a lot of debug stuff on here because I didn't work on this for very long. But this JSON object here is the user object I got back from the Facebook parse after sending my credentials in. And they come back like that. So this application is a very simple CRUD for servers and scripts. The account link doesn't work. Log out, guess what, logs you out. Um, so these servers, what I've done in this particular app is I make it so you, if you fill out this form at the bottom, you can figure a host name, a port, a username, and the path on your local machine to your private SSH key. Uh, and all, that's all I store. So this is, this is my database contents right here on Facebook Parse, and it just has identity path, and this is the path on my machine to my private SSH key. What those <coughs> credentials are going to do is allow me to SSH into my server and do what? any one of these scripts that I've also added to my database. So this one is ls space dash la, list all files. This one's install torrent, anybody know what torrent is? It's a com private composer repository for PHP. It's kind of like running your own NPM or running your own Ruby gem server. Um, this essentially fetches all my repositories and rebuilds that repository for me. Uh, this one is get uptime, it just runs the uptime command on my server. So. With this, I can go back to my home page. I can select the server that I want to connect to. I can select the script I want to run and hit run. And I'll get real time output, assuming it can connect to that server on this connection. Yeah, it's going. So this is slowly spitting out the console output from that particular script. Not the most exciting thing in the world, but you can see how well, the way that this benefits is because it holds my private my identity on my machine but it, and it just references the file path and the, my code base here will just read that file given that path and connect to the server and run the script for me I actually use this every once in a while because I don't like SSH in the servers <laughs> that was one of the examples uh, really quick look at the source code um, so this is what a typical um, Electron main <coughs> app file would look like. Uh, you require the app, which is the main <coughs> process of your Electron app. Uh, the browser window, window module <coughs> is something you pull in so that you can then create a browser window. This is a lot of bootstrap crap we don't have to worry about. So when the app is ready, and notice this is just straight up JavaScript. When the app is ready, our browser window, the main window variable, is defined as a new browser window with the given coordinates. Uh, I load in index.html into that browser window, and that's it. And then I've got uh, JavaScript code that runs inside, so this is my, who knows what Vue.js is? Oh, come on, guys, Vue.js, V-U-E-J-S.com. It's better than jQuery, it's better than Angular, I'm biased, I admit, but it's awesome. Better it's than React? Better than React, again, oh, yeah. my opinion. Uh, but like I said, I, I know people who know who are React people, and they say, oh, Vue.js is getting too much of a hype. It doesn't sound as good as React. Um, so this, you know, when I'm logged in, I define this user as the user. And this, here's my JavaScript, and it's, this is something you could run in a browser, and it would just do the same thing. The benefit that I have is if I find the, uh, I haven't touched this in forever, so I don't know. Tab home, here we go. The template, blah, blah, blah. 
there's a method down here called run. And you see all I do is uh, I set running equal to true, and that's for like progress indicators and stuff like that. You don't have to worry about that. But then I create a new SSH connection. Once that connection is ready, I can go ahead and uh, I guess I define my callback. And I all the way down here is where I pass my connect object. Now all of this stuff is, is, is simply documented in a, in a readme somewhere off of npmjs.com. So this is nothing fancy. This is just something you can include in, your, in your, your web page. But at the same time, an SSH connection from the browser is impossible. So the, running it in this kind of environment is going to give you that benefit where you can slowly spit out lines, um, make that SSH connection, read your SSH key. Where was that? Yeah, right here. Private key, I require the file system module and I read the file <coughs> synchronously based on this path. It just gets the contents of the file and sends it into my connection. So that's something you would not be able to do from your browser. Um, Slack users, one more time. Who uses the Giphy cert integration? Yeah, In right? the first couple of days. First yeah. couple of days, and then you get old. Yeah, it gets old. Yeah. Giphy is not. Uh, not something I'm a huge fan of, but I thought it would be really easy to build something with. So um, I've got this application running. Looks great, right? Can't see it? It's because what this particular application does is it registers a global keyboard shortcut. In my case, it's command I. Um, out of curiosity, anybody recognize this alert? The styling of this alert? It's called Sweet Alert. It's just a JavaScript library you pull in, doesn't even need jQuery. It's pretty and really easy to use in case you don't like regular browser alerts. Um, this, so this is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that I pulled off some library just like pulling down Twitter Bootstrap. Um, and it, you can make your window transparent. So the window that this is actually, if I were to click right here, nothing would happen because there's a bit of margin there. I could spend some time resizing it, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> so this is just a, a web page, but the, the, it's been uh, deemed as Chromeless and transparent, the particular browser window or the frame that the uh, operating system is running. So all you get is the contents of the page. So I can search for LOL, and it tells me, OK, I copied it. Well, what did we copy? <laughs> there you go. Uh, if we did something like um, derp, that's always a good one, right? Paste that URL. Beautiful. <laughs> Again, kind of a dumb example. Nothing groundbreaking here as far as functionality goes, but I'm just trying to illustrate some of the cool things that you could do, such as, in this case, register global keyboard shortcuts. Um, stop that one. I've also got, you know what, did I build this one out? Bet you I did. Let me try this one real quick. Just bear with me. in and if I push this button something happens. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to embed the Rickroll video. There we go. With advertisement. Yeah. The old Rickroll, no, this is the the new Rickroll, the old Rickroll from it's on Ven uh, Venmo or whatever that YouTube channel is. They can't you can't embed it just anywhere. So it says click here to play on YouTube. So um, again just I'm interacting with the serial port to make this possible, something you can't do in a browser. Uh, oh, and then the, I exposed, this was the first app I did, the same one, and you can uh, click to change me, type in something else, and it updates it. Again, nothing groundbreaking here, but just to illustrate how that works, or how you can get a really pretty window. This is a, to get it to look like this on a Mac, I, this is you know what the system one looks like. You got the, kind of the bar that's separate from the application. This is hidden inset. That's one of the settings. When you create the browser window, you have the ability to set. Well, this is, this is the type of bar style I want. I can make it hidden. Again, I can make this Chromeless altogether so these buttons don't show up at all. 
Yes, please. Okay, do you have to do this on a per operating system level? Do you have like per OS sort of settings? That you kind of. Let me show you. Um, in theory, if you build your code right, you can distribute one app to all, one source code to all of them. Obviously, you have to build them separately. Okay, but you wouldn't have to like specify what the windows look across different platforms? Correct. So if we went to the way to go in and do this, did I lose the key? Is the key still right? So the documentation, I'm going to go down to the browser window, browser window module. <laughs> browser window. Uh, <laughs> And you've got a host of options that you can send in. So the ones that I sent in originally were just height and width because those are the only two required ones. But I think I came down to, uh, oh, skip taskbar, whether to show the window in the taskbar, that's a nice one. You can turn kiosk mode on. Uh, you can, I, I set frame false on one of those other ones. Um, auto hide menu bar is a thing, dark theme, transparent. Uh, Title bar style string. Now this particular one is OSX only. So their documentation is really good about saying, well, this setting is good for OSX, this one's good in Windows, this one's good in both. It also supports Linux, so there are some Linux features that they outline as well. So I think I use hidden inset for that particular. Uh, oh, also, I, uh, Mike, did I show you this one? The node integration, you can turn off the Node.js environment in your browser window. So one of the things I had to do for one of my Facebook parse integrations is, is it wouldn't, Facebook parse, their, their library wouldn't allow me to log in as a user in the server environment. There's a difference between a Node.js server environment and a, just a JavaScript front end environment. And so you can turn that node behavior off in the front end if you wanted to so that you can use Facebook parse to connect. Yes? Do you need uh, like administrator privileges to do some advanced things? Like say you were to generate a TCP connection from a client to a server, that's so on Windows. Sometimes you have to run programs as administrator to be able to access that level of system. I would assume probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Especially if you're going to use some of the lower number ports. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I don't know. I'm not a Windows person at all. I have a Surface. I should have brought it and had something. I'm sorry. Well, on, also on Linux or on Mac either. Do you know if you have to do that for Mac? I mean, well, on, on a Mac, you don't run as administrator. You run the application, and then if it does something that it needs, the operating system deems necessary for an administrator, they'll probably just prompt you. So I haven't run into anything in my testing that actually has prompted me for administrative privileges. Um, but I know if uh, in Atom, in the editor, if I open my host file, make a change and hit save, it'll just prompt me, do you, you know, I need an administrator password to touch this file. And I assume that Electron just, it got an exception while trying to save to that file and was told the operating system to show the administrator prompt. I'm not exactly yeah. sure how that works. Okay. But yeah. So if you were to edit the host file on Windows, I bet it would not save and it would not prompt you. Before yeah, you would need to boot Adam as administrator to do that. <laughs> um, so kind of on this node integration, um, when you've been doing this, I'm trying to Where's the line between like front end and back end? Because you know, like the the pop up window to change something, you know, that's all just typically that would be in your front end app, and then you'd have a separate app for your node. So, so it seems like they kind of overlap. In, in some in some ways, they do. Yeah. Um, the way I built that app, uh, this one, right, um, is I is I created a view. We did it. Um, yeah, kind of interesting if you uh, <laughs> move around your, uh, if you resize your window. Oh, sure. Sure. Kind of uh, <laughs> specifically making it smaller. <laughs> so, um, performance wise, this does a lot better than your browser. So, like, <laughs> It could be the browsers on here choking a bit with it. Um, who knows? Uh, but the desktop app from the test I ran ran it incredibly smooth. Um, and again, the no permissions. So as everyone saw here, we got the permissions. And uh, Mike, about the uh, Talkbox API, how hard would it be to switch this to screen share? How it appear in? Oh yeah, it's uh, built into it. Actually, it's, just, it's yep. built in the WebRTC. It's yeah. just a button guy press and uh, trigger yeah. call method. Cool. Correct. Yep. And uh, um, also, you get <laughs> the uh, like you have with your uh, what was the communication piece you're using for chatting and stuff? Dave's 
Yeah, yeah. So it's got it's got a web sockets like uh, communication piece too, so you can do text, just audio, video, okay. screen sharing. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so WebRTC as a whole is, is quite the topic. Yeah. So that that's that's Mike's little demo he had. Um, this through here. This one is not, and the reason this one isn't because I knew we were gonna have a bunch of people in here, so I changed it to uh, what TalkBox calls their routed mode, um, and that does run it through a, um, a streaming server, because the way we have it works. <laughs> it's a peer-to-peer -peer mesh, so when you were doing a one-to-one -one chat, it's all cool, but when you get three in there, four in there, we're all encoding each other's strings <laughs> to one another, and so you end up just... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this version is not, but by default it is here. Anyways, so that so yeah. was a great idea of yeah. what we do in the web can be made better on, on desktop, mm -hmm. and that would be a pain in the ass to do <coughs> otherwise. That took me an hour. Is, uh, is this compatible like with lots of operating systems? Because like that's really nice that we don't have to worry about compatibility with WebRTC, but then again, do we have to worry about it on the electron level? Yeah, um, I, I can't say I've done a bunch of testing to get it to work. I, I know that I got that the first, um, the sweet alert pop-up one, I got working on my Surface, <coughs> and it, it literally took me nothing to do it. I just ran npm install electron go, and it just ran. Um, I don't have to answer the question. Their documentation talks about all that kind of stuff, though. Um, and they've got build instructions for Mac, Windows, and Linux, build system overview. I don't know. They talk about all this stuff, and a lot of it's over my head. I just, you can download a pre built version, and in theory it works. I think to that question, one of the things that I immediately thought of when I saw Slack was built on is Slack took forever to get a Windows version out. If it would have been so easy, like you know, what what held them up from just popping out the windows? When it, they obviously ran into issues. So I would be curious. To know. Yeah. I've kind of something uh, related to that. So I did notice um, you were using uh, ES6 in the server side thing. Have you ever run into um, compatibility issues with your browser side not supporting ES6? Um, I, I I don't think I used ES6 intentionally. Where did you see that? Yeah. Oh, bank ticks and the braces. This one? <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, that this is probably which one is this? This is probably the first one I did. This is using the um, the uh, quick start guide file. Yeah. Oh no, that's not it either. Um, yeah, I don't know. I did. I didn't intend to write any ES6 stuff in here. Uh, I would assume it's going to work on the client side just as well. Well, the runtime that you have on like both the node side and Yeah, because it, I mean, it's running right in the same kind of environment, and Node.js does support ES6, right, out of the box. Is there going to be like WebKit for all supported platforms, or is it always Chromium? Yeah, it's always Chromium. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a WebKit uh, based environment. Uh, they talk about it, again, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert in this kind of space, but. Uh, because in that case, it wouldn't matter if you're using ES6 or not. 
Right. Electrons and Baptists. Chromium browser. Yeah, okay, so yeah. it says this web page is as its GUI, so you can see it as a minimal Chromium browser controlled by JavaScript. That's pretty awesome. It uses Chromium for displaying web pages. Chromium's multi press process architecture is also used, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah, uh, so, two questions. Have you called any or have you tried to use any Java libraries or Java classes? Question one. And number two, would, would this sort of make sense? as a new skin in front of a legacy Java app if you want to update the UI, just do a new UI in front of it. How, um, hard, how hard would that be to utilize legacy Java libraries? My experience in writing Java was pretending to know how to write a Minecraft mod. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my idea. My idea was there's a block and it's either red or green based on your Travis test passing or failing. That was my idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it didn't work. I have no idea. Never touched Java in my life. I mean, I pretended to, but so sorry. I don't know. Um, I know that JavaScript is JavaScript, and I if, if anybody know if Java works with JavaScript in tandem? Uh, no, no they're different languages, as far as I understand. So yeah. Now what? JavaScript is entirely marketing. Yeah. What what I would recommend, uh, especially like I mean, if I were to distribute my company's application this way, which is something I want to do, and my boss is thrilled about, so I can't wait. Uh, that means everything is API driven, kind of like writing your application in Angular or all Vue.js or React. If you just build your entire application, navigation, and everything in <coughs> front end, any kind of database persistence or data fetching you're going to have to do is a data an API call over AJAX. So that's that's kind of how I would approach it. If you can expose everything that your existing code base does into APIs, then you could definitely rescan it and just have it consume those APIs. Yes. Yes, I'm just. Uh, what's what's the advantage of using this over, say, a traditional uh, desktop uh, development system? You don't have to go learn a traditional desktop development system. It took an hour to do a video it's streaming cross desktop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cross platform, single source uh, uh, code base. That's pretty sick and nice. Um, and, and the reason why I'm so excited about this, especially for this audience, is because we are web developers. We know JavaScript, we know HTML, we know CSS. Benefits, probably nil, to be honest. If you could go out and find a person who's good at writing Objective C, sorry, I'm a Mac guy. You find a good Objective C developer and they're going to ship a really awesome app, great. That's what I would probably recommend you do. But it's this is great for budgets. You know, if you get if you're on a low budget and you want to spit on an application real quick, it's somebody that a web developer can do, and they tend to be cheaper. Um, that's it. It's like that. So basically, what you're doing is you're taking something that you develop, if you haven't developed it, you could develop in a, in a web setting, and you just extracted it and made it work on a desktop. Or well, yes and no. Yes and no, because my Giphy, my little Giphy thing. So if I hit my global keyboard shortcut and make that Giphy API call, that's not really something you build a web application for. What my, my goal here today was to illustrate how we can use our current skill set to create desktop applications to solve a different set of problems that we are restricted from doing as just web developers. Does that answer your question? Okay. So you talked about how this can kind of, you can compile your app and build it and then ship it off, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's some nuances to building things on an actual operating system, like going through compiling. So if you were to say compile it on my Mac, would it work on, say, his older version? I don't know the answer to that question uh, for sure. I know that what I'm running these apps on for the sake of this demo is I ran npm install global electron pre-built. Um, and and, and it, it, so there is a pre-built binary that it downloaded. You can also download the source and build it yourself, but I, I'm not really 100%. So you're not actually like building this for this demonstration, it's just kind of, you already have the wrapper that was installed. Would other people need to have this, or would you just ship them the actual? I would ship them the wrapper with my source code dropped in it. Okay. So yeah, the way they their distribution guide says, download the pre-built version, rename it, uh, again, on a Mac, you rename the .app file, you right-click and hit show package contents and drop your source into the app folder right here, change the ICNS file and change the plist file, and then there's your app. 
the Windows is ex is stripped by. I, am I incorrect in that you can't extract or view the contents of an EXE? You're correct. I, I'm correct that you can. Yeah. 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 Is it, oh, you cannot. It's compiled. Yeah, it's straight binary. It's just a straight binary. It's not. Okay. It's not, there's no resource fork in it like there is on a .dot file. Sure. This would be like a general virtual machine. Well, the literature mm -hmm. is basically this is a virtual machine. It is. It's and you're running not the whole file code on. Yeah, I, I I don't know the innards. Sorry, I just know that uh, we uh, this is where you put or that's how you run. The same way the browser has your JavaScript sandbox is what you're running. It's the V8 engine, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a browser that I'm great. Application distribution, Windows and Linux. You put your stuff here in this path. And then you execute electron.exe on Windows. I, I don't know. I didn't build it on Windows. What I did is I downloaded the pre built <coughs> on my Windows machine. I downloaded the pre built with NPM. So, what's going to happen here is that like, you're going to have a folder that has electron.exe in it with those folders within, well, inside the same folder. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, okay. It's just going to be It's just a runtime. The other thing I know is that you can package your app into a single file. That's probably it. Yeah, uh, well, like, this is your source, though. But the, well, there's no like show contents on Windows, so you can't show the contents okay. in the EXE file. I can't you use like WinZip or something to no. extract it? I well, it's <laughs> different. <laughs> For zip files that are like compiled, like uh, made to be executable with WinZip, yes, you can do that. You can just okay. name a file, but yeah, I sorry guys, I'm not a Windows guy. Read the docs; they obviously make it possible somehow. Adams <laughs> releases that way, so I'm not not the guy to answer that question. Sorry. Yes. You mentioned that Electron uh, update quickly. If there was, uh, say, a bad update or an update that you didn't want, could you go back to an older version of that? Uh, app? I'm not entirely sure. If I remember what the APIs look like, the upgrades, uh, the auto updater, your APIs are. So there's an event that's fired that is error, emitted when there is an error while updating. So I'm guessing, because the update, what the update is, is it, it gets a URL from your update server, and your application, the Electron wrapper, all it does is download that file and put it into place. There's no building or anything weird that needs to go on, it just puts it there. Actually, it might do NPM install. Uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure. But um, if, if there's a problem, I assume it's just errors. Uh, and you, you have that hook. Um, and then the methods are, you can set your feed URL, check for updates, and then the other one that's not here for some reason is restart and update. And, and none of them have, this one and the, the restart and update one doesn't have any arguments, so I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that either. Yeah. So what's the exposure to the operating system? Is it just anything that Node can do? Or is it, Any can, or can go deeper than that? Um, probably just anything Node can do. And if you can find a native Node library to do what you want to do, great. But I mean, yeah, that's all I got. So I've been kind of setting my like, baseline is if there's a Node package, it'll be yeah. a problem. Yeah, and that's and that's like I said, the only I, I'm not an expert at this. I haven't shipped anything with this. I've just played, but I thought it was so much fun. And like I said, I couldn't talk about Orient this time. And I thought to myself, how cool would it be if half of you guys went home and all of a sudden we're app developers? You know, yeah, it's gonna take some time and learning and adjustments and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's well documented. My biggest thing about any documentation is you have to learn how to read how they document their source code how they document their application or APIs, because reading is one thing, knowing how to read it is another. So I don't have time to live code. I wanted to live code. Do you guys still want me to live code? I will. Do you really want to? Yeah, I don't mind. What are you going to live code? I'm not afraid of live coding. Do it. What are you going to crank out? Code? I'm going to crank out. <laughs> I'm going to crank out the stupidest app. But I guess what I wanted to do is illustrate how quickly we can make this happen. So, so I'm going to. Uh, Giphy 2. Um, so the Windows EXE is 70 megs. I'm sorry? So the, the Windows EXE for Electron is 70 megs. Okay. 
Not too shabby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, do you want to see? provided by Electron, it lets you create trade applications. I am pulling in the Giphy API. I say when my app is ready, I'm gonna instantiate my new tray icon, give it a path to a little picture I've got here. And I think this is right. When, when, when you click on the tray icon, we're just gonna console log clicks for now. Uh, let me just verify that that's the right API. I'm constantly in here reviewing the API. Uh, a lot of it is event driven. So yeah, events clicked, okay, so. We'll do that, and all I got to do is run electron with a dot there, and fix my typos. Run it again. See my little kitty cat? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I click it, well, let's look at my console. Nothing there. I'm gonna go up and click it. Click. Yay! Woo. So now I wanted to create a menu, uh, and the way you do this is, uh, so I'm going to get rid of the on-click handle, we don't need that, and I'm going to say var menu equals uh, and menu equals And, oh no, this is an array. Okay, and we have a JSON object that's a label is LOL. Clicked, I think, is the handler. And then we'll also say label is dirt. Okay, and I'm gonna define a function up here. Um, actually, I'm gonna do it as a separate module. Um, so I'll pull in the clipboard module. And we'll just say um, Giphy. 
based on the query. I think that's how it works. So now in this pile, uh, we'll <laughs> actually no, we can just say here, I'm going to say require <coughs> Giphy and we're going to send in LOL to this one and require, we're going to send in derp to this one. And then we just say, uh, what is it called? Tray icon set context menu, I think. And menu. And if we oops, run that again, watch it fail. Uh, where's the example here? Build from. So we got our kitty up here, and when I click it, I've got LOL and derp. So we'll go ahead and hit LOL, and nothing happened because I'm awesome. So I need to verify that I built this right. Is it just click? Yeah. It always is. It's always, it's some key to consistency. Okay. So we'll do derp, and we'll see what happens. So here's the API response right from Giphy. So I want to grab data uh, image URL. That's what I'm going to copy off of that. So, and so this is error. Um, so we'll just say uh, clipboard, write text, uh, data that. And that should be it. So right now if I go to my clipboard, I've got a GIFI URL.